Hello and welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you here. We have a very special guest with us today. We have Matt Miller from School Spirit Vending. Welcome, Matt, and thank you for joining us on the podcast. Hey, John. Thanks for having me on, man. Let me tell you a bit about Matt. Matt Miller spent his first nine years of his career as an Air Force pilot before entering the private sector to work in both the medical device and advertising industries. While a top performer in the corporate world, his long-term desire was to be his own boss. A good friend one day mentioned the gumball machines he and his young daughters owned, and that conversation began a 10-year business quest that has brought Matt's company, School Spirit Vending, to the cutting edge of both the vending and school fundraising industries. Today, School Spirit Vending's franchising program provides a proven and profitable business system for busy professionals and their families looking to develop secondary income streams with a limited time commitment. Matt, again, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you here. Tell us, Matt, a bit about your background. Where are you from, Matt? Uh, I'm from the Chicago area originally, John. Grew up there through high school, ended up going to the Air Force Academy for college, and out of the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, ended up being, becoming an Air Force pilot. I flew for nine years in the Air Force, got out back in 1998, uh, got sick of being told what to do and decided that I uh, could make more money in the corporate space. So got hired in the corporate space first in the medical device industry and then in the advertising space. Worked corporately for about 11 and a half, 12 years mm-hmm. and uh, finally realized that I really needed to do stuff on my own along the way. Started doing some businesses on the side, trying to help make ends meet and figure out how I could ultimately walk away from the corporate thing. And along the way, read Robert Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, bought into the whole idea of passive income and set about trying to figure out how to develop that for myself and my family and had a good buddy of mine from church who mentioned he had some gumball machines and he uh, was talking about what he did and the simplicity of it. And it was something that he and his daughters could do together. And I was like, well, you know, I'm in pretty deep financial hole right now. I don't have a whole lot of extra money to spend. And gumballs are pretty doggone cheap, but Mm -hmm. the margins are so high that even though they're inexpensive, I could really start to make a dent fairly quickly in our financial situation. So found my first used candy and gumball machine on eBay, taught myself the industry after reading a couple of eBooks off of Amazon and set out starting to figure out vending on on a part-time basis outside of my full-time advertising career. So that's kind of how the whole vending thing got started. Within a year and a half, had about 125 locations or so around Houston. And then 07 and 08 hit. And when the market tanked, there was a lot less people going out to frequent the businesses where I had machines in okay. and, ha- and had several young kids come knocking on my door right around that time trying to uh, raise money for their local school selling me stuff. And so I thought, well, maybe I could put machines in the schools. I could get some kids off the street and the business wouldn't be quite so impacted by the ups and downs of the economy because the kids are in school nine, nine months out of the year, five days a week. So that's where kind of the whole idea came from. And fast forward to today, we've been doing it nearly nine years. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I was curious, as, as you were talking about the growing up and the choices that you made, I'm curious about your parents, Matt. Have they been entrepreneurial like yourself? You know, actually not, John. My mom and dad were both teachers. Uh, They are artists and on occasion would sell some of their work in art shows or that type of thing. But that was pretty early in my life when they were trying to raise a little bit extra money just to take care of us kids. But they're, they're both educators. And so I really didn't get a whole lot of that growing up, except for the fact that If I wanted to make some extra money to do what I wanted to do, you know, I learned how to mow lawns. I knew I learned how to shovel snow in the winter. Mm -hmm. I helped out a buddy deliver newspapers for a while. So I was doing entrepreneur things at a younger age, though I never really equated that to something that I would do long term as an adult. Mm -hmm. And what, Matt, what made you 
want to go into the Air Force and become a pilot. Is, is that something in your family's history, serving in the Air Force? <laughs> Actually, it's not at all either. Mm-hmm. I my my parents, since they were teachers, there when I was a senior in high school, all four of us kids were in a different grade in high school, and mom and dad told us early on that if we wanted to go to college, we were going to have to figure out a way to make it happen ourselves because they couldn't afford to send us. Mm. So I started looking into options as far as what I could do to go away from school, and it had to, had to do with a buddy of mine of my dad's who we ran into one Saturday morning at an art show. And he asked me what I was doing. I told him I didn't really know. He said, well, have you ever heard of the Air Force Academy? I said, no. And he said, well, it's the equivalent of West Point or Annapolis, but it's for the Air Force. It's in Colorado Springs, Colorado. You should check it out. And upon checking it out, I found out that it's the equivalent of a you know full ride scholarship in exchange for several years of commitment to the Air Force afterwards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, so this is an opportunity for me to go to college, to go to school away from home and kind of get out and experience new things and, you know, not go into debt to do it. So I applied. Thankfully, I was did very well academically and I was very active in sports and musicals and music and And worked about 20 hours a week my senior year as well. So I was kind of the ideal candidate for what they were looking for. And so ended up getting accepted, not having any military background in my family whatsoever. So it was definitely a rude awakening hopping off that bus for basic training back in uh, 1985. But, man, I mean, it, it helped establish me in my career. And, you know, it's foundational in what we're doing today. Yeah, I can imagine it was. I, I can imagine the, the discipline involved in becoming a pilot. I'm sure that has something to do or maybe a lot to do with your, the success you've had. Would you say that's true, Matt, or is it something else? I, I would say it definitely has a part, John. A student who goes through pilot training in the Air Force, you know, it's, an, it's a year-long process. And it's taken step by step, day by day, syllabus item by syllabus item. So that's kind of the way I've lived my life for for a good part of it. That coupled with the fact that as a pilot, we live by the checklist. And we've got a checklist for everything. There's the before taxi check. There's the engine start checklist. There's the before takeoff check. There's the after takeoff check. Because there's so many steps to flying an airplane safely that those checklists are are very very important to ensure that steps are not missed that could be life threatening and so that being said i think that thought process is a lot of the same thought process that i've followed in my business career and you know laid out the processes that would need to happen in order in order to get things done you know put together timelines and priority lists and and of course, setting goals along the way and realizing that, you know, monumental change is not going to happen overnight. It's a process and being willing to commit to that process for whatever period of times it takes, I think has been one of, one of the biggest, you know, parts of my success is because, you know, in our gener- in our generations today, it's this whole microwave society. Everybody wants get rich quick. Everybody wants something for nothing. Everything wants something tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And life isn't that way. And there are very, very, very few of those people that are truly overnight successes. So I got busy just doing the daily grind that was necessary to put a business together. And of course, now, you know, I I look like a hero for what we've accomplished. Mm. But it's, it's taken a lot of years you know, to put the pieces of the puzzle together to make this a reality. Yeah. And thanks for sharing that. These these are valuable lessons that you're, you're teaching here. And it's, it's great success that you had, like uh, the numbers that you mentioned before. So when you started with your gumball business, initially within a year, you had 127 locations. But, uh, but what, what interested me was you mentioned when you started, you bought a secondhand one from eBay and you bought a couple of ebooks to learn the business. So you didn't just like buy one and go, hey, you know, let's see if I can place it somewhere. So you, you did due diligence. 
and I'm guessing after you read those books, you maybe created a plan of attack, or and maybe initially tr- maybe placed one and sort of got, got an idea of what the process was like, and then created a plan of attack on how you would get those 127 locations. Yeah, I mean, we were in a deep hole financially, so every little bit could ha- you know would help. And I'll never forget, John. I did that reading. I found that machine on eBay and actually it was across Houston. So I didn't even have to pay shipping. I just went and picked it up with my, a couple of my kids and my 98 Honda Accord one Saturday. But the next week I got, uh, after work, I set out starting to figure out how to get that machine put in a location. And I, I don't know how many doors I knocked on. It was a lot. Well, yeah. And, and I finally found a karate studio who thought it was a great idea who let me set up the machine. And anyway, that was the beginning. I'll never forget it. This equipment typically, you know, four to six to eight weeks service cycle. So, you know, the equipment does its thing and you don't have to mess with it a whole lot. And I'll never forget after two weeks, I was chomping at the the, the bit to figure out, okay, is this thing really going to work? Do people really use these machines? Because I never did. And mm-hmm. my kids never really did. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> So I'll never forget, it was a Thursday night. I went by the karate studio. The place was packed with kids you know, there for a class. I put the, the key in the machine and opened the thing up, and the quarters just spilled out everywhere. And I was <laughs> like, holy smokes, the, I, I'm on to something. Mm-hmm. Well, after a little while, I could start to predict you know, some averages as far as the, the locations, how many of them you know, all that. And so I could put together and run some numbers to see, okay, if I do this for X amount of time and I have this many locations, this is what I can see from it. Mm. And so I just got excited about that process, realizing that every new location was one step closer to me having control over my family's finances and me having control over my time. And so I just got busy doing the work, you know, over and over and over again, all over Houston until I found enough locations that would say yes. And, you know, that was the foundation for it all. Yeah, that's exciting. That's fantastic. I actually, about a year ago, um, I had a similar idea. I I, I can't remember where I got the idea from, but I've always been interested in creating passive income. And it's interesting because the book that changed my life, my way of thinking, was Rich Dad Poor Dad. I read it back in 2005. I was, had that's a computer awesome. support business. And, uh, and that's what got me started on the road to where I am today. How I was able to leave my computer support business and create an online business. Because I, I wanted to have more time freedom and get paid more for a, a business rather than my time. I didn't want to swap my time for money. And anyway, right. about, a, about, a year, about a year ago... I had this idea to, okay, let's buy an arcade machine and place it in a location and create some passive income from it. So I purchased, the first arcade machine I purchased was also second hand. And the person that I purchased it from, he'd been in the industry for like 30 years and, and had hundreds, placed hundreds. So he gave me an idea of which businesses I could approach to place the arcade machine. And I was able to place it very quickly but the problem with the arcade machines i i don't have a ute or a trailer or anything like that they're very big and they can be very heavy so i actually end up purchasing three and putting them in locations two locations one in one location two in another location but i ended up selling the machines because i don't have a ute or a trailer so it's hard for me to move them around and they're very heavy so right. that's something for you to know. If anyone there is thinking, okay, I want to do something similar myself, just that's something to consider with arcade machines. So, but with the gumball machines, they're not as big. Are we talking like toys and lollies in these machines? Well, well, I mean, to begin with, it was literally, literally gum and candy. Mm-hmm. And then over time, I ventured into temporary tattoos and stickers and, and toys and that type of thing. But to begin with, it was just candy and gum. And over time, I slowly but surely got myself around people that could give me little bits of information. I found a Yahoo group online that I was a part of for a while and slowly put the pieces of the puzzle together 
that allowed me obviously today to, to have the business that we have. But yeah, it was a process. The reason why, you know, when I mention to people that I'm in vending, most people think about the big full line vendors with snacks and sodas and all that. Yeah. So when I tell them stickers or, you know, the back then gumballs or candy, they, they kind of look at me cross-eyed like what? They don't look at it as real vending, but that equipment is very expensive. And all I had when I got started, John, was a 98 Honda Accord. And so I didn't have any choice. I had to do something that was compact mm. that I could carry around in that car and built it from there. Once we started into schools, I put in my first 75 locations still in that Honda Accord. And then right. eventually I was able to buy a Honda Odyssey van so that I'd have a little bit more space. But a lot of that was out of necessity. I also didn't want to mess with circuit boards and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I was looking for something that was purely mechanical that wouldn't take me a whole lot of time to service, wouldn't ha take a whole lot of time to troubleshoot if there was an issue, but that could be a workhorse for me and my family and, you know, provide some pretty significant money over time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's really good points. And getting into schools. Now, I don't know what it's like where you live, Matt, but in Australia, it's something that, like, I would think to myself, I wouldn't even consider approaching schools. And, and maybe, you know, uh, that's the wrong way to think of it because of the red tape. So is that something you had a problem with? Or is there any red tape or regulations around putting vending machines in schools? You know, I can't speak to Australia, but in, in the U.S., really the only regulation is that the government has come down in the last couple of years and said that, you know, anything that is uh, bad for your health, candy or sweets or sodas or whatever, is not allowed in government buildings like that where it's available for kids. But otherwise, you know, every every school and district has their own policies, and we've just learned how to work with them. And we provide enough value with what we do and how we do it that we don't believe it or not, we don't see a whole lot of issue with that um, in most cases. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of approach do you have, Matt? Do you have a set script or set approach? Do you have a written approach? Do you approach businesses first verbally, like knocking on their door? And has your ratio of acceptance increased over time? The, you know, the ratio has definitely increased over time because we've been building a brand all along, right? And and just like any other company, that takes time. But over time, being willing to work and continue to promote is when, you know, things can really start to happen. So, yeah, it, it's definitely gotten better over time. The other thing is, though, we've got a number of different things we do. We've learned just because of my advertising background that not everybody responds to the same type of messaging. Mm -hmm. What you might respond to, I might not respond to at all. So because of that fact, you know, we used what I we use what I call a multi pronged approach where we do a combination of a number of things from mailings to email campaigns to to face to face door knocking to trade shows. You know, we're starting to do a bunch of social media and all that as well. Mm -hmm. But all of those things together are what ultimately brings us and has brought us the success that we have, if that makes sense. Because not everybody responds to the same thing. Not everybody comes to every single trade show or whatever. So so doing a multitude of things over a period of time is what we found has really been the key to it all. And so how has the business evolved, Matt? So it started off with you placing the gumball machines, 127 locations, then you branched out to schools. And what is it you do today in your business? And also, in particular, you provide franchises. Is that correct, Matt? Correct, correct. So we got started initially, and I expanded for a while with a distributorship and licensing model where I essentially taught people how to do what we we do and establish territories for those people in different parts of the country. Uh, about a year and a half ago or so, I've been working with a, a guy by the name of Aaron Walker as a business coach here for the about that period of time. And he, he and I were talking one day, and he had done some research to see, you know, how much opportunity there was in our space. 
And even though we've done extremely well, you know, there's still a lot of opportunity out there. And so we got to talking and, and he said, you know, it seems to me the only thing keeping you from from being in a lot of these other schools that you're not in right now is they just don't know who you are. He said, so why don't you get busy figuring out how to go about letting them know who you are and continuing to grow your team and in the process beginning to expand in some of these other parts of the country. So that's exactly what we did. And and when I started looking, I realized that the, you know, the marketing costs were going to be very, very prohibitive if all that I did was continue to do things the way I had been doing it previously. And so we did some research. I, I got with my attorney and, and that type of thing. And what I learned was that the best way to move forward, the most easy way to move forward is was becoming a franchise. So mm-hmm. we've been franchising here a little bit over a year. And things have, I mean, things were going great before, but they have completely taken off. Um, it's amazing what some online marketing and some of the things we're doing there coupled with with having a franchise and a model that is is accepted, that has had its due diligence done to it in order to be a franchise, et cetera, is following the government rules and regula- regulations of a franchise. How many people are out there looking to be part of a tried and true and proven business? Because there's a lot of people that would like to make passive income and s- develop some more security for their families, just like you and me, that are out there. And now we've got folks contacting us on a daily basis, wanting to look into what we do and are are expanding even more rapidly than I ever imagined could happen previously. Yeah, that's great news. And I know for myself, I started off in a franchise back in 2003 when I was working in IT for a company, it was a medium-sized company here in Australia. And I, I wanted to have more time flexibility to help my wife more and have more time with my kids. So I, instead of jumping into my own IT support business, I bought into a franchise because the, the likelihood of success if you join a franchise is a lot higher than if you go it alone. So that's what you've got going for you if you go into a franchise. But also, I can imagine with a school spirit vending type franchise business system it's also passive income all the benefits that we've talked about today of having the business the machines aren't big you 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 can do it in this normal type car and all those kind of things it's just i can imagine it why it's so successful your business and why it's so appealing it makes a lot of sense so uh, my question to you matt too is starting a franchise yourself going from the distribution model so you went from doing it yourself to having distributors within a set area then to a franchise was that a big deal for you to be able to actually create your own franchise it was a huge deal but i'll i'll hearken back to the some of the comments we made early on in our conversation john not knowing that i was doing it for this purpose i had put systems in place along the way mm. because i knew that i couldn't be the end all and be all for people So a lot of that that a lot of franchises, I think, have struggled with to begin with, I had already done. So because of that, I was able, you know, I just needed to get the legal representation, you know, to find out what was required as far as the government and that type of thing. But thankfully, it was a lot simpler than I thought, even though it did take, you know, in an inordinate amount of time this last spring to put it all together. But, you know, thankfully, I was... Had, it was kind of doing what was necessary to become a franchise, even though that's not wasn't really ever in, in my thought or on mm-hmm. uh, even an idea for me, you know, yeah. for the years prior. Yeah, it's like a book I'm reading again for the second time, The E Myth by Michael Gerber, yep. and and he yep. talks about the importance of not working in your business. Yep. creating systems so people can take over. So it actually is a business rather than you being a slave to it. So, yeah, that's that's fantastic you did that. Tell us about some of your franchisees. Tell us, is there any success stories that come to mind? Oh, uh, there's, there's a bunch of them, John. I mean, I've got, first off, we've got folks from all, all walks of life, you know, whether they be a, a, a brand new 18 or 19-year-old who was part of their parents' business, 
be, you know, came of age and decided they want to do that, wanted to do this on their own to folks that are in their mid sixties that are, that are looking to this for retirement or whatever. You know, we've got military folks, we've got, you know, folks from the educational sector, we've got salespeople, you know, it's crazy. A lot, a lot of the people that have reached out to us recently, believe it or not, is IT professionals. I, th- I think they are much more analytical. And so some of the things that Kiyosaki and some of these people talk about in relation to money, they're a lot more aware in their life of what they're doing and what they need to change, you know, to get where they want to go financially. Um, but I think also they're they're looking for a way to maybe change some things up instead of sitting in front of a computer all the time. But we've had a huge influx of folks in that space here over the last six months or so. That being said, our biggest operator is a, a young guy by the name of Shane. Shane barely graduated from high school, has no college education, and was a car wash salesman for a number of years before he got started in SSV. But then I've got another couple that just recently got started. Uh, he runs a several hundred million dollar company. She owns and runs a uh, a dance studio. And they're excited about putting together a business that they can do as a family. Hmm. And he's eventually wanting to work his way out of, you know, what he does currently, because there's obviously a lot of stress and a lot of time involved in running a huge company like that. So, I mean, talk about the extremes, but the commonalities in our team are people who are looking to diversify. They're looking to develop an income on a part-time basis that they don't have to quit what they're doing right now in order to do. Uh, They like the idea of the social aspect of what we do and the fact that, that we're, you know, we're helping out local education and local schools along the way. And they like the fact that they can do it with a family. You know, my kids have been involved from the very beginning, initially helping me assemble machines and, and collate stickers to where they've worked trade shows with me. They've gone door knocking with me. They've gone servicing with me. My son at 10 years old was my first graphic designer. (laughs) He's almost, he's almost 20 now and he's been doing graphic design for me for almost 10 years. Mm -hmm. Now does design for companies all over the place has ventured into web design and uh, app design as well. And my daughters are, are following kind of in the same path. So you know, I disliked the fact that my family wasn't really welcome in the military or in the corporate world. So when I was able to start something for myself, I wanted to change that. And what that's one of the first things I, I changed because I feel that our job is not just to take care of ourselves, but also to help raise up another generation of entrepreneurs. And uh, so we've created an environment that allows us to do that. Yeah, that's fantastic. And another thing too, besides all those benefits that you mentioned, is that it's, it's such an easy business, an easy business model. You don't need a college education to do this type of business. So I think that's Correct. another uh, big positive of it as well. So which areas does the SSV opportunity exist at the moment? Well, currently we're located or, and exist in the U.S. We are in the process of doing our research and and looking to get started in some other markets here in the fall. Canada will probably be our first choice. I've had a bunch of inquiries from Australia as well. So that's Mm -hmm. another that we're in the process of looking at. And I envision in the next five years or so that that we're in, you know, eight, 10, 15 different countries because, uh, you know, the model makes sense to a lot of different places Education is all, always has need for additional funds, and you know kids love stickers. Matt, just in, in closing, any thoughts that you'd like to share with our listeners? Yeah, John, I would just tell folks, you know, that you can do it. the The challenge that I find a lot of people have out there is they continue. They're thinking about getting ready to do things instead of actually taking action. And the only way that you figure things out, the only way that you solve the problems, the only way that you figure out is your business idea really something that is worthwhile, that people will pay for, and that you can make money at, is if you get after it and start doing it. Now, that doesn't mean that you go out and you leverage every last penny you've got and, and 
you know, mortgage your house and all that other stuff. No, you got to be smart about it. You know, that first gumball machine I bought in doing some research, I realized that I could have turned around and sold that for twice what I paid for it to begin with. Mm -hmm. So there was no risk there. Yeah. Even if this hadn't worked out, I could have made some money on the machine that I bought. So taking calculated risks, but moving forward and and getting excited about taking incremental steps every single day. You know, you're not going to get there overnight. The get rich quick stuff that you see online isn't real. It's going to take work and a lot of effort and you might as well get about it. And for me, I was looking, I had two choices in my mind. I had either the 40 year plan, which was me working for somebody else for at least 40 years and completely being at their whim financially, time wise or otherwise, or I could get busy and spend two to three to five years or more to put something together that I owned that mm -hmm. I had complete and total control for and of. And so I chose to take the, the shortcut, which took a lot of time and a lot of effort. But now I, I do what I want when I want. I come and go as I please. Mm -hmm. I've been doing this now as an entrepreneur full time for five years. And it's a pretty cool place to be. Yeah, it definitely sounds like it. Look, we really appreciate you being on the podcast today, Matt. And you've shared a lot of great stuff with us. And I think myself, I, I think it's a fantastic opportunity. And I'm not just saying that because you're here. I, I truly do. And again, it is something that I did look at myself. And anything, I don't really know of many opportunities out there that will, A, create passive income for you and that are so straightforward and don't take a lot of a lot of capital to start up. So, And, and again, family-type uh, business, everyone can get involved. So there's just so many pluses to it. Now, for anyone that would like to learn more about what Matt does and get involved with SSV or School Spirit of Vending Business, you can go to Matt's website, ssvbusiness.com. But in particular, you have a free report for people, Matt. Is that correct? Yeah, I've got an ebook, John, that I developed. It's called Live Your Dreams, The Top 10 Reasons Why You Need to Own a Vending Business. And it just shares some insights in my years of, of being in vending that most professionals probably have never even thought of before and, and have probably never taken vending seriously, to be honest, because they don't see real money in a quarter or, you know, in 50 cents or what have you. So I would encourage them to check that out. They can go to SSB, SSVbusiness.com forward slash IMFAQ and download that for free and if they want to begin a dialogue we can do that otherwise if they just want to learn some more basics about our industry i'm happy for them to have that ebook and best of luck to them all right great thank you matt again really appreciate you being on the podcast today matt we got so much out of it i know i did i'm sure everyone here listening did and so i want to thank you again matt and i also want to thank everyone for being on the podcast and listening today thanks again john and god bless